Welcome to The Leader, the Evening Standard's daily news, analysis and commentary podcast. It's released at 4pm every day. Make sure you get it on time by subscribing through your preferred podcast provider. Now, from The Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. Rory Stewart spoke to the leader about his ambitions to be London mayor and laid down a challenge to Boris Johnson. I can criticise Labour, I can criticise the Conservatives. The only thing that I care about is sorting out London. So I can say to Boris Johnson, deliver those 6,600 police officers. You said you are going to do it, we want them now. He speaks about his commitment to bring down knife crime in the city and will he really resign if he can't? Also... The Queen is the Queen of Canada and um, this is her grandson a prince of the realm, then the Prime Minister has said that he will make sure that he's safe. Our royal editor Robert Jobson as Harry's summoned to meet the Queen over he and Meghan's resignation from the family and our exclusive report on Canada offering to pay for the rebel couple's security. And it's been going through a pretty rough time in terms of the slump in sterling after the Brexit vote, which means that their costs, which are in US dollars, have increased. Travel journalist Simon Calder on Flybe, the budget airline reported to be on the verge of collapse. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, Rory Stewart on how he'll tackle knife crime in London. Rory Stewart's surprise announcement that he's running for London mayor set the election alight in October. But as an independent candidate, the man who once ran for the Tory leadership has been some distance behind Sadiq Khan. The last poll, released by YouGov QMUL in November, showed him in third place with 13%, behind the Conservative Sean Bailey on 23 and Mr Khan with 45 Nevertheless, our editorial column thinks the run-up to the vote will prove interesting. Londoners get to pick their next mayor in May. The contest is heating up. Rory Stewart is a credible challenger with big ideas on things such as crime. Rory's no longer a Tory. I was expelled from the Parliamentary Party because I voted against the no-deal Brexit. The Conservative candidate Sean Bailey has big ideas and will fight to win too. When I get up in the morning, I'm thinking about how do we make London safe. And the current mayor, Sadiq Khan, will defend his record as a leader who can bring a diverse city together. Well, I'm really pleased now, four years in a row, We have frozen TFL fears. It's going to be a fascinating battle. Rory Stewart's written for The Standard about his commitment to tackle violent crime in London, and he's with me now. Rory, your article reveals some of the stories you've heard on the campaign trail. What sort of things have people been talking to you about? I think the most striking things that stay with me are mothers who've lost children to knife crime and sitting in their houses, their homes, and watching them share photographs and talk about sons who they adored, who lit up their lives, and who, in a matter of minutes, disappeared from their lives and were killed. I was talking to a mother who was preparing Sunday lunch with her son, and he went around the corner to get a lollipop for his two-year-old and was stabbed in the chest on the way home. And it's that. It's that sense of loss. Do you get a feeling that Londoners themselves don't feel safe in their city? I think people do feel that crime is going the wrong direction. And they're right to feel that. That's not just an illusion. The truth of the matter is that homicide rates in London are now at an 11-year high. They're worse than they've been since 2008. That is not a good situation. And there are other things, you know, crime going up outside primary schools, 13 of the 20 worst cases in the country are now in London. So people are right to be worried and it needs to be sorted out. So for me, of course, walking, listening, staying with families is about learning from experience. But as a mayoral candidate, it is about addressing it, and fixing it. Okay, but this is not a new problem. What can you do differently that previous mayors have failed to do? It's very complicated. There are many things you have to do, but the most important thing to address it in the short term, to bring violence down immediately, is to get the policing right. 
And that is not a magic bullet. That is basically about many, many thousands more police officers on the street, visibly with communities. That's outside primary schools. That's in the estates. That's spending the time really getting to know these communities. Now, behind that, you have to do a lot of other things. You have to do things with communities, with youth clubs. But if you don't get the policing rights, you're not going to be able to bring violence down. So this has to involve Westminster as well, then. What would you be saying to Boris Johnson? Firstly, deliver on the promise that you made to deliver 6,600 more police officers to the Met. But this isn't about the central government in the end. Yes, it's great to get those more resources, but the mayor is the police and crime commissioner for London. The mayor is in charge with a £3.4 billion budget and over 40,000 police officers and civilians. It's the leadership from the mayor that's going to make the difference here. As in any organisation, leadership from the top is the key. Are you really prepared to resign if you can't bring those figures down? Yes, of course I would. Now, this isn't a um, question of simply a promise. It's a whole attitude to doing work that if you're serious about what you're doing and you're saying to the public, vote for me because I will reduce knife crime, you have to be prepared to say that if you don't, the public should get rid of you. That's the proper relationship. And I did it with prisons. And what I found in prisons is that it has an electric effect on the organization because suddenly everybody understands what the target is and what they're working towards. And that sets the priority. But at what point would you resign? Would it be within the first year as London mayor? Would you give yourself two years? I think the first thing is to make sure any agreement on that is absolutely as clear and transparent as possible so nobody thinks you're playing around with the numbers. So I'd like to sit down with police officers, with journalists and others, and come up with a fair analysis of what reducing crime will look like and how people will judge it so nobody thinks that you're playing around. The Evening Standard's advocating the public health approach to bringing down violent crime in London. That's the sort of thing that's been seen in places like Glasgow where it's been effective. Is that what you'd like to see? I think it's a very important bit. And a lot of this came from somebody who I saw in Chicago and saw his work in Chicago, this guy called Gary Slutkin. And he's brought this also to other countries. It's been done in Glasgow. It's been done in New York. It's been done in L.A. But a public health approach is fine in theory. The key is doing it. And the frustrating thing is that we know how this can be done. The question is getting on with it and doing it. And the core of it in Glasgow, as it should be in London, is good community policing. Yes, there's a lot of other things around it, understanding why people get drawn into knife crime and providing all the surrounding social economic security for people. But community policing is at the core of that, and that's what we haven't got right in London. Do you think you have the backing of the police with that message? I think I do, particularly of uniformed response officers, community police officers, constables, sergeants who feel on the ground that they're not getting the support, they're not getting the training, they're not getting the priority on this work. The challenge for the police is they're being asked to do 120 different things, genuinely heroic work and often terrifying work. They're seeing people... Dying, they're having to be a combination of counsellors, social workers, some cases almost soldiers, and they're doing all this day in, day out. But for me, everything begins with the uniformed officer on the street. If you don't get that foundation right, nothing else is going to work. On that campaign trail, is violence in London the number one issue that you've been hearing about? What other things have people been talking to you? For me... In the end, you have to have an optimistic message, which is about transforming London, about an extraordinary future for London. Yes, it's a difficult time. It's a difficult time with Brexit, and it's a difficult time in terms of safety and in terms of housing and transport. But you need the optimism. But you're not going to get to that great future unless places are safe. You can't have good businesses, good schools. You can't have a good life in London unless you're safe. So you've got to get the basics right. How is running a mayoral campaign different to running for Tory leadership, Rory? Well, it's completely different because everything focuses on the place. So for me, instead of being in offices, I am mostly out on the streets. I'm staying with people. I'm eating with people. I'm walking with people. I've spent most of the last uh, four or five days around Lambeth in different parts of this big borough, nearly seven miles long. And I suppose I've probably had... 40 or 50 in-depth conversations with different people, and that includes people who have themselves committed crime and been to prison, or mothers who've lost children, or sisters who are coming to terms with it, 
or police officers who I walk with. All of this is just getting me the feel of things. It's, it's completely different to the way that you think about it as a minister. When I was the minister for prisons, I had to force myself to make sure that every week I was in a different prison with prison officers. Otherwise, in government, the danger is you're just buried in paper. And you're running as an independent. Is it different to not have the, the backing of a major party behind you? What kind of difference does that make, actually? Well, the first thing is you're completely free, totally free. So I can criticize Labour. I can criticize the Conservatives. The only thing that I care about is sorting out London. So I can say to Boris Johnson, deliver those 6,600 police officers. You said you're going to do it. We want them now. And I can say to Sadiq Khan, you have not gripped this situation sufficiently. I don't need to be afraid of anybody. And the problem with any political party candidate is they're looking over their shoulder all the time thinking, I don't want to offend my own party and I want to insult the other party. An independent can be polite when they need to and challenging when they need to. And come that election, do you really think you'll win? I believe I can definitely win. And I think that the key way to do this is to make people understand that an independent candidate can really speak for London and to make people understand the mayor of London has real power. The mayor of London has more power than the mayor of New York. The mayor of London has this enormous budget. And we need the mayor to stand up and say, I have this power, I have the money, and this is how I'm going to use it, not to keep making excuses. Do you think the current and previous London mayors haven't fully used their powers then? And that would include Boris Johnson and Ken Livingston. So Ken Livingston, I think, is a very difficult man, and in some ways a very unpleasant man. And I very much dislike his anti-Semitism. But he was, in many ways, an effective mayor. Much of what was achieved in London was achieved before 2008. And I think one of the problems in London is that we haven't seen people fully using this role, using the money of this role, using the power of this role to really transform the city. It's being uh, done as an, almost a ceremonial role. People are behaving as though they're uh, you know, a member of the royal family or something, not as though they are a chief executive running a city. I know Mike Bloomberg a little bit, who was the mayor of New York, and what impressed me about him is that he approached it like somebody really running an organization. He has the data on the board. That's how I ran prisons, and I believe that's the way that we can help London. And you can read Rory Stewart's article in the paper or online at standard.co.uk. Next. There's some clarity that needed to be put on the whole business of the finance because the way that the Duke and Duchess described it on their newfangled website was simply not true. Royal editor Robert Jobson on his exclusive story about Canada offering to pay Harry and Meghan's massive security bill. Arriving in satellite trucks and cars, flown in from all over the world, the media set up camp outside the Queen's private Sandringham estate, ahead of one of the most important summits of her time as monarch. Prince Harry has been summoned to appear before her, along with his brother William and father Charles. His wife Meghan was expected to contribute from Canada by phone, and that country may provide one of the solutions to a huge problem. Who pays for Harry and Meghan's security if they're not in the royal family? Our royal editor, Robert Jobson, is with me. Robert, what's the offer being made by Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau? Well, my understanding is that um, the Prime Minister has made it clear to the Queen that as Canada is a realm and that Prince Harry is a prince of the realm, that whilst they are living or residing in uh, Canada, um, he will make sure that their security is not jeopardised. At the moment, the Governor-General of Canada um, is guarded by the um, Mounted Police and has a special protection unit. That, that unit will be extended to cover um, Prince Harry whilst he's staying in um, Canada. Obviously, if they travel abroad, then that will be the responsibility, um, or we'll find out if it is, of Scotland Yard or be taken on by Harry personally. So that's the security covered, but one thing that's starting to emerge is how much money Harry and Meghan go through. You've discovered that Harry's father seems to be footing quite a large bill himself. Well, no, I think there's some clarity that needed to be put on the whole business of the finance because the way that the Duke and Duchess described it on their newfangled website was simply not true. There are mistakes and errors on there. The 5% of public money they claim is um, is all they get is simply not true. That didn't cost, include the costs of around about £600,000 for uh, security and also there's a number of missing for, for travel, etc. So that figure's not right. 
My understanding from people close to the Prince is that he's not only been paying for Harry and Meghan through profits from his Duchy of Cornwall, the profits from the Duchy, by the way, are for the heir to the throne to do whatever he wants to with. It's just that he happens to continue to pay his sons and their families from that money. But not only that money, but from his private income, from private investments, he has paid quite considerable sums of money to Meghan and Harry, and to be fair, William and, and Kate, to, such as the refurbishments of their their homes, and the hall being one for William and Kate, but also Frogmore Cottage. The entire we've heard a lot about the two point five million that the taxpayer has come effectively paid for through the sovereign grant, but the actual soft furnishes, the inside was all paid for by the prince. He also picked up a huge bill for the the royal wedding. So um, you know, I think that along the way, he's quite justified really to feel. A little bit hurt by what's happened. That story was covered in our morning audio bulletin available through your smart speaker. Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. Now. Flybe, one of Britain's biggest airlines, is reportedly in serious trouble. 2,000 jobs are said to be at risk as it tries to avoid collapse by securing emergency funding from the government. The company's not commenting on the reports. Travel journalist Simon Calder's at an airport, not getting a Flybe flight, but he joins me now on a somewhat crackly line. Simon, Flybe is Europe's largest regional airline carrying millions of passengers. How could it get this close to failure? It's never much fun being a regional airline like Flybe, where you've got air passenger duty adding £26 to every round trip. Add to that the fact that it's been going through a pretty rough time in terms of the slump in sterling after the Brexit vote, which means that their costs, which are in US dollars, have increased relative to its receipts, which are overwhelmingly in sterling. Unfortunately, there have been many examples of it not being a particularly well-run company, which is why, of course, Virgin Atlantic came along with the Stobart Group and also with an American hedge fund and said, we'll, we'll pick you up and that way you'll be able to keep going. But that apparently doesn't seem to have been enough. Where would that leave people who have booked their flights? These days, almost everyone books flights using a credit card. Um, most of those people will be protected. There will be some uh, corporate customers um, who will be losing out, but they tend to book quite late, so therefore there won't be that many of them. But my understanding is that the uh, government very, very much wants uh, Flybe to keep going. And that's The Leader. We're back tomorrow at 4. Subscribe through your podcast provider to make sure you don't miss out. See you then.